Welcome to Change Bible Church Telecast. All of our sons have shared the word of God, oh my God, by the name of Pastor Malazzi. I'm asking you to open your heart, receive the word, and just be in tune with the revelation of God that is placed upon his life. This is all to build, of course, the body of Christ and for you to be benefited and for you to be ministered to in Jesus' name. Amen. Change Bible Church. Greetings in the name of Jesus. I'm Pastor Casey Malazzi, the son in the house of our Corner Light Change Bible Church. We are dealing with the subject of prayer. And of course, uh, I would like to take this time to thank and appreciate my father, my mentor, and my pastor, Pastor Nzo, for this opportunity. Uh, I really feel honored. I really feel humbled. Now, we are going to deal with a subject entitled Building Through Prayer. We are dealing with a subject entitled Building Through Prayer. So what we want to do then is to profile the life of Nehemiah, just a little bit of, of taking a study from the life of Nehemiah and looking at how he built through prayer. Now, we are going to start in, in Nehemiah chapter 1 and, and, of course, from verse 1. The word of Nehemiah, the son of Makalia, it came to pass in the month of Shislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah and asked, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived Jerusalem, who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left, from the captivity in the province are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Verse 4, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So here is what I like about Nehemiah is that when he faced a situation where, where you know, he had bad news and it was difficult and it was bad. He wept for many days, but he did not end at weeping for many days. He went into prayer because he understood that tears are not going to fix this, the problem, the, the situation. Tears are only but for an emotional expression, but prayer is necessary to bring us to the solution of the matter. So that is why then he went into prayer just after the days that he took for mourning. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, when we look at this, we, we realize from Nehemiah's story that prayer became a first aid for him. So when he looked at the situation, when he heard about how bad things are in Jerusalem, the first thing he resorted to was prayer. Which means, in other words, he realized that I cannot build anything or I cannot restore anything in my life except through prayer. So prayer was very, very much essential to Nehemiah. He knew that he could not do much without prayer. So that is what, what we need to learn as children of God, that we need to draw strength from prayer. We need to learn to draw strength from prayer because when you face life, you know, it, it is, I think it is Eugene Haybecker who once said, life is difficult. He says the reason why people are frustrated in life is because we have people who don't want to acknowledge that life is difficult. And, and he continues to say, when you acknowledge that life is difficult, when life becomes difficult, you become prepared because you were anticipating life to be difficult. But when you don't want to acknowledge that life is difficult, when life becomes difficult, you become frustrated. And so, so, so we need to live with the reality that life is difficult. And when once we step into that reality, we will know that we need God in our lives. So we need to draw strength to face life out of prayer. Why is it important for us to pray? Because prayer removes the burden from us and it puts the burden on God. It is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, where the Bible teaches us that, you know, uh, cast all your burdens on him because he cares for you. So prayer is very critical in us transferring the load from ourselves 
to God. Because God is the only one who's capable of bearing the burden. Some of the burdens that we are facing in life cause us depression, they cause us sickness, and we end up not, not, not knowing how we are going to survive out of this life. But prayer is able to take the burden from us and transfer it to God. That is why Nehemiah wept for many days. He cried, he mourned for many days. But after that, he took the burden of mourning and casted it on the Lord. He understood that if I don't present this to the Lord in prayer, nothing is going to change. So that is why then he went to the Lord in prayer. So before, as, as, we, as we are going to continue, we are going to continue reading. But before we go there, maybe let's, let, let's look at some few key purposes of prayer. Some few key things that we need to understand as the purpose of prayer. Number one, prayer is a sourcing of power from God. Number one, prayer is a sourcing of power from God. When you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 7 and verse 8, the, you realize that Paul was going through a difficult situation. He says there was a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to torment me. And he says, three times I went to the Lord to pray about this. And the Lord said to me, my strength is sufficient for you. For when you are weak, that's where I show my strength. So, so in other words, in fact, God says my grace is sufficient for you so in other words God was saying to him sometimes I need you to be weak because when you are weak that's where I show my strength so sometimes weakness is a sign that we need God uh, sometimes weakness is there to help us realize that we need God because prayer is outsourcing of power from God imagine if life was smooth everything was going fine you wouldn't need you know you, you wouldn't see the need for God in your life that is why sometimes things become hard, things become difficult. Why? Because we need to be reminded constantly that we need to outsource power from God. And that is what prayer is for. Prayer is about outsourcing power from God. You know, prayer allows us to use what we call borrowed power. Sometimes you don't have the, the enough, enough energy to do it in your, uh, uh, you know, on your own. You don't have enough power to, to accomplish certain tasks. But when you pray, you borrow power from God. You are, you are borrowing power from the spirit realm. And you are now exercising what we call borrowed power. Because, you know, the power to do something only can come from God. He's the one who created everything. Nobody was there to help you. Him. so that is why he's capable of doing all things so prayer is sourcing power from God number two prayer is a means of fighting the unseen number two prayer is the means of fighting the unseen second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 through 5 for though we are in the world we fight not like the world for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through the Lord to the pulling down of strongholds now when he talks about the weapons of our warfare bear in mind Ephesians chapter 6 because Ephesians chapter 6, that's where the Bible tells us that, you know, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this present age and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realms. So then uh, Paul goes on to list the weapons of our warfare. After that, in verse 18, he talks about prayer. He says, pray always with all kinds of prayers and supplication made for all the saints. And he continues to say, pray also for me so that, you know, I, I don't find myself getting disqualified after after I've preached to others. So in other words, Paul was saying to sum all the weapons up, prayer is the primary weapon. That's what Paul was saying. Uh, above every other weapon that I have mentioned, prayer is the primary one. That is why when you go from verse 18, he mentions prayer almost three times because it is the primary thing. So when the Bible talks about the weapons of our warfare, it talks within the sphere of prayer. I hope I managed to build a case there. So when it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through the Lord to the pulling down of strongholds, it talks primarily about the weapons of prayer. And remember that strongholds there, when you read the theme around, you know, three, verse 3 to verse 5, the, the, the strongholds there is talking about things that come to your mind. So prayer is essential to fight some thoughts that are coming into your mind. Some negative ideas, some negative thoughts that try to cluster your mind, you need to fight them through prayer. That is what the Bible is teaching us. So prayer is fighting the unseen. Sometimes life doesn't come together. You do everything right. And all of a sudden, things are not getting together. You wonder why. There are some unseen forces that are fighting behind you. And that is why we need prayer. Number two, prayer is a means of fighting 
the unseen. Number three, prayer is, is our hiding place. Prayer is our hiding place. The book of Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are always saved. And when, when we talk about the name of the Lord, especially in the New Testament, when they quote the Old Testament, talking about the name of the Lord, they are talking within the sphere of prayer. Uh, an example would be Romans chapter 10, where Paul talks about how we get saved. You know, uh, he, he talks about the fact that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he builds his case to say, how do they call on the one whom they did not believe? And how do they believe in the one whom, of whom they have not heard? And how do they hear unless somebody is sent to preach? So he's building a lineup to say, there is a preacher, there are words that are spoken, there are people who believe, and then there are people who call on the name of the Lord. In other words, there are people who pray. So it's a preacher, it's a message received, it is faith, and then it is prayer. So you realize then that, you know, prayer becomes a hiding place. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it. So when we talk about the name of the Lord right there, we are talking necessarily about prayer. We are talking about the fact that you, when you call on the name of the Lord, you find a hiding place in this strong tower. So, so it is very important for us to understand that prayer is a place where we can hide ourselves. Because, you know, the enemy will always attack. The enemy will always try to find devices on how to destroy our lives. But prayer becomes a way of hiding ourselves. You cannot, you cannot always run. You, you need to come to a place where you hide. And here is a verse that says to us, the righteous run to the name of the Lord and they are always safe. So in other words, the name of the Lord becomes a refuge. Right there, I'm reminded of, of Psalm 91, the Psalm of, of protection. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So you realize that when he continues, he says, I, sh I shall say of the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress. You realize that he, he comes to the realization that at some point in life, I need a refuge and I need a fortress. And that is where the name of the Lord comes in. So number three, prayer is our hiding place. Number four, we receive revelation through prayer. I'm going to come back to this point at the later stage. We receive revelation through prayer. You realize in Daniel chapter 2 that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And when he had a dream, he called all his wise men and they came and they could not unravel the dream. And then... Yeah, uh, Daniel came and then he said, well, give me some time. Let me go and talk to the Lord. He prayed and the Lord revealed the dream of the king and the interpretation of the dream. So you realize then that revelation was harnessed. It was accessed through prayer. That is why it's very important for us to understand that prayer is necessary for us to be able to get revelation from God. Uh, you know, uh, while we are still there, I'm going to come back to that point, but while we are still there, you need to realize that, you know, you, will not, you are not necessarily supposed to get it wrong every time. You know, I, I know that, you know, they, they, they always say we learn from our mistakes. You can avoid mistakes by going into prayer and asking for revelation. So you don't have to always go through error after error before you get it right. You can just go into prayer for God to give you revelation so that you can do things right from the start. So it's very important for you to understand. Number four, we receive revelation through prayer. Number five, we overcome the enemy's traps through prayer. Again, Daniel chapter 6, you realize that, you know, that's where Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. When, when they set the trap for Daniel, Daniel knew that when he prays, he's putting his life in danger. But Daniel also knew that there is a better reality. The reality is, if I don't pray, I'm not going to survive. So, so there are two realities that we are dealing with. We are dealing with the reality that there are snares, there are traps that are set for us. But we are also dealing with the reality that there is a God who's able to see the snares. And that is why, you know, the Pesalomist says, you have delivered me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. So you realize that God is able to deliver us from the snare of the fowler. God is able to deliver us from the traps that the enemy has set for us. So it is very important for us to realize the importance of prayer. We overcome the enemy's traps through prayer. You will never know what is going on behind your back. That is why you need to constantly live a life of prayer. You'll never know who's around you. That is why you need to continually live a lifestyle of prayer. Now, let's go back to Nehemiah. Let's go to chapter 2. 
we are, we are still building a case on, on how to build through prayer, how to build your life through prayer. Now, here is Nehemiah in chapter 2. Of course, he approaches the king, and the king could see that this man is sad. He's not, he's not himself. And in verse 11, uh, okay, yeah, in, in, in chapter 2, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, in chapter 1, and when we read from chapter 2 from verse 4, chapter 2 from verse 4, uh, when you read from verse 4 there in chapter 2, it says, Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to God of the, to the God of heaven and said to the king. So before he responds to the king, he goes to prayer again. Here is Nehemiah who's saying, I'm going to build my life around prayer. So I'm going to pray to God. And before I talk to the king, I'm going to go back to prayer again. Why? Because God only God is able to change the heart of a king. Remember that Nehemiah is a slave. And as a slave, he does not have any rights. So the king had the right to say, I'm not going to listen to you. Why should, why should you even come into my presence with a sad face? The king could have rebuked him. The king could have sent him to, to be slaughtered. But when he approached the king and the king asked him, what is it that is worrying you? Nehemiah starts first with prayer. Verse 4. Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to God of heaven and said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Send me back home so that I can go back and rebuild. So here is Nehemiah presenting a plea to God. And here is what, what we learn from this, this aspect of prayer. Prayer is not only enough if you are not going to do something after prayer. Prayer is not enough if you are not going to take action after prayer. So in other words, Nehemiah is saying, while I am concerned, while I'm presenting my case before God, I still need to do something. He says to the king, if you can release me so that I can go back and rebuild the walls of my city, of my homeland. So prayer requires for you to take steps. We are going to come back to that, that concept again. So here is chapter 2, verse 11, where we meet now Nehemiah inspecting the wall. Chapter 2, verse 11, it says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And then I rose at night and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God has put in my heart to do in Jerusalem. So he walks into Jerusalem. He finds other men there. He doesn't tell them why he's there. Then when you continue with reading the story, I don't have enough time. When you continue with reading the story, you realize that after inspecting the entire wall, Nehemiah says to the men, guys, let us go and rebuild the wall. So in other words, it was after inspection in verse 17, it was after inspecting the entire wall where he says to the men, now we've got, I've, I've got the know-how of how to deal with the situation. So in other words, prayer requires action. Prayer requires for you to take action. Bishop Tudor Bismarck says this. He says, prayer is not in the success equation. Prayer is in the revelation equation. Prayer is not in the success equation. Prayer is in the revelation equation. Hard work is in the success equation. So in other words, after you have prayed, you still need to do something. Because prayer is in the revelation equation. Remember, I said we're going to come back to the point of receiving revelation through prayer. So here is what you need to understand. Prayer sets you up for you to receive a word from God so that you'll be able to know the next step of action. Prayer sets you up to receive a word from God. An example would be Habakkuk chapter 2. When you read the book of Habakkuk chapter 2, God says to Habakkuk, write the vision down and make it plain upon a tablet so that a herald may run with it. So in other words, God is saying to Habakkuk, when you leave the place of prayer, you must have had a revelation. You don't walk into prayer and live empty-handed. When you walk out of the place, the atmosphere of prayer, you must have a revelation. Why? Because a revelation is a propellant, is a guideline for action. Revelation is a guideline for action. So you will not know what to do until you get a revelation. But, but you know, you know a revelation is a guideline for vision. A vision is what you need so that you can act. So when, 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 when God says to, Nehemiah, to, to, to Habakkuk, write the vision down, he's saying basically you need to get out of prayer knowing exactly what you are going to do when you get out of here. 
Because when you come into the presence of God through prayer, you are stepping into a vision level. You are stepping into a revelation level where God reveals things. And I'm speaking like this, we are living in difficult times, times of uncertainties, where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, where we don't know who's going to get sick tomorrow. But prayer can be in a revelation level where you know what the right steps to take are right in this time of difficulty. Because prayer is in the revelation equation, but you still need to do something after you have prayed. So let's go back to Nehemiah. He's inspecting the wall. When he inspects the wall, he wants to make sure that he's got the necessary material to build with. He's inspecting the wall to ensure that he knows he's got everything he requires so that he can do the work. That is what we call inspection. Now, while we are still there, let's deal with some few principles. Let's deal with some few principles. I call them Sira. I call them Sira. C-I-R-A. Here are some principles of action that we need to take. It doesn't matter what sphere you are in, whether you are in business, whether you are employed, whether whatever sphere of life you are in, you can apply these principles. Here are the principles of Sira. Number one, we're talking about the C, comprehension. Comprehension talks about the fact that you need to have the know-how. You need to come to a place where you know how things work especially when you are in the business world. You need to know how things operate. You cannot be in business when you don't have the knowledge of how business operates. Your business will fail. You need the know-how. When you are going to be hired in a new company, you need to know how the company operates. So uh, in preparation for the interview and everything, equip yourself with the knowledge of how the company does things so that you know that knowledge can give you a cutting edge you can you can be above those people around you you are going to be interviewed with you need to know that you need to have the knowledge what we call comprehension the knowledge of how things are done and sometimes comprehension will require you to study that is why paul says to timothy study hard to show yourself before god as one approved and unfortunately, especially when we talk about pastors, pastors don't believe in going to Bible college because they believe as long as I'm called, it's fine. No, 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 no. Paul was talking to Timothy, who he says he learned the scriptures from youth, from his grandmother and from his mother. But he still says to the same Timothy who knows the scriptures, he still says to him, study hard to show yourself approved before God. So as a man of God, preaching in a big church, in a small church, wherever you are, you still need to study. You need Bible college. It will open your eyes into some other things. It will, it will help you get equipped in some other areas of life. You, can, you, cannot, you cannot afford to, loo to lose touch. You cannot afford to be irrelevant, especially in these days where knowledge is increasing. You cannot afford to be irrelevant as a man of God. You need to study. That's what we call comprehension. Number two, we're talking about innovation. The second principle of Sira, innovation. Innovation talks about the fact that things might not always follow the conventional route. Things might not turn out the way you anticipated. You need to come up with an idea of how you are going to still get things working when things are not following the, the normal route. For instance, we are living in the times of pandemic. Right now, you cannot no longer, if you are a business person selling something, you can no longer stand in the side of the road and sell because it's no longer safe. So you need to know how now you are going to sell to people who are sitting in lockdown in their sofas at home. You still need to now to come to a, another level of selling to people who are no longer available within your vicinity. That's innovation. So in order for you to have an, a cutting edge, you need to implement some ideas of making you better than the people you are around. You need to come up with strategies on how you are going to sell your product irrespective of the inconveniences. So that's what we call innovation. Number three, we're talking about CIRA, resource management. Resource management, number one, you need to evaluate what you have right now. You need to evaluate what do I have. When Jeremiah walked around, or when Nehemiah walked around the wall, he was looking at what do I still have available. Remember that the wall was bent down, but there were stones that were still intact. So he was looking at what do I still have right now? What can I use to build with? What, do, do I still need to borrow material from somewhere or do I have enough resources to rebuild the wall right now? So he went and made an inspection to check if he's capable of doing the work with the resources that he has or whether he needed more resources to be uh, brought in into the project. So you need to evaluate what you have right now. 
What you can, you need to know what you number two. You need to know what you can do with what you have right now. You need to know what you can do with what you have right now. So that's resource management. And number three, you need not be wasteful with resources, especially at the time that we are living in. Resources are very essential. You don't have a guarantee that you will wake up with a job tomorrow. But that doesn't mean you have to be collapsing down and, you know, fainting. You need to understand that the resources that you have might have to last you for an extended time. So don't be wasteful with resources. That is very important for us to understand. Number three, we're talking about resource management. Number four, we are talking about, uh, in the principle of CIRA, we are talking about adjustments. What are adjustments? When we talk about adjustments, you, you, you look at how you can use what you have to get what you don't have. So in other words, even within the equipment that you have, you might still be undersourced. You might still not have everything that you need, but you still have something that you can do to get what you need in order for you to still do the project, to still continue doing the work. Uh, for instance, right now, if you are running a household, it's difficult. You don't know where the income is going to come from. But when children wake up in the morning, they need food. They don't need some, some explanation of I'm not employed. They need food. So you need to learn to manage the resources that you have so that you, know, you are able you know, to to, 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 to fend for the coming days, even though it might be difficult for the coming days, but you still need resources to manage the situation well. So you need not be uh, wasteful with your resources. You need to learn how to adjust. Here is one thing, especially when we talk about soccer. Here is one thing that we need to understand with soccer. Whenever people cross the ball so that somebody can score the goal, the ball will not always come the way they want it but they still need to make it work even if it did not come the way they wanted. Sometimes when we talk about adjustment, sometimes you don't have the necessary equipment to do the task, but you can still do something with what you have in order to get what you don't have. Even if the ball comes the way they want, there's still an opponent who wants to head it out of the way. So you still need to deal with the fact that the ball that comes the way you want might be shifted from your way. So you still need to find a way of making things work in an, in an unconventional way. So adjustment talks about the fact that if I've got some equipment that I don't need, but I've got something else that I need, how can I sell what I have so that I can get what I need? Because at the ultimate end of the day, the vision must be realized. Do I, do I have too much from this area and little from that area? How can I balance? How can I exchange with somebody what I don't need for what I need? That's what we call adjustment. So, so here is Nehemiah walking around the wall, looking at the wall, trying to understand what do I have at my exposure? What can I use to build the next level of my life? What do I have? You know, what is it that is still lacking? so that I can know whether I've got what I need and, and whether, you know, what I've got is not enough. So Nehemiah is going around the world inspecting to ensure that when God answers his prayer, he is well equipped to do what God needs him to do. Now, let's, let's close it with, with, with chapter 4. Let's close it with chapter 4. Unfortunately, we can't go through the entire book. Chapter 4, and we are looking from verse 15. Now, in chapter 4, we realize that there are enemies who come against this man. Uh, the two guys, the two prominent guys are Sanbalat and Tobiah. Sanbalat and Tobiah coming against the vision that God gave to Nehemiah. Now, in verse 15 of, 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 of chapter 4, Nehemiah, uh, it says, and it, it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought the, their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears and the shield and bow and war and war armor. And the leaders were behind all the household of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried the burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at the construction and with another hand they held a weapon. So here is the construction work continuing. But while the construction work is continuing, there are enemies. And I'm here to tell you that when you are a prayerful person, there will always be enemies to pray. Because you cannot be a prayerful person and the enemy just looks at you. There are enemies to pray. Sometimes just after you pray, the situation turns the opposite direction. 
Just after you prayed, things all of a sudden spiral out of control. Just after you prayed, you know, the person that you thought was going to help you, all of a sudden sent you a message and says, I can't help you anymore. There will always be enemies to pray. But here is Nehemiah. He says, while the enemy was threatening us, because the enemy started mocking, but now he elevates the mocking to the level of intimidation. And the enemy says, we are going to fight you. We are going to attack you during the building project. Here is a man who prayed to God and he believes God that he's got a vision from God to rebuild the wall. But the enemy is trying to stop him from rebuilding the wall. What do you do when your prayers gather enemies? What do you do when you are in a prayer, prayer mode, when you are in the atmosphere of prayer and all of a sudden the enemy, the enemy attacks you with those thoughts that you are never going to amount to anything? What do you do when you are in a mode of prayer and the enemy attacks you with those ideas that, you know, nobody has ever been successful in your background? Why, why do you think you will make it? What do you do in the atmosphere of prayer when you are a prayerful person and all of a sudden things turn around? Here is Nehemiah who says, we equipped ourselves to continue building while we are fighting. There are times when you are going to have to fight for what you believe. There are times when, when, when you are a prayerful person and things turn around and you are tempted to change your prayer, but you need to fight for what you believe God for. It is Paul who says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. In other words, he's saying to Timothy, whenever you step into the sphere of faith, there will always be a battleground. Everything that you do believing God for, there will always be war following you. Remember when we talked about the purpose of prayer, there are unseen forces that are fighting against you. And God is saying to you, or God is teaching us through Nehemiah today to say, when you are faced with a temptation to quit, instead of quitting, prepare yourself to fight. Prepare yourself to fight for what you believe God for. Prepare yourself to fight for what you uh, expect God to do. Because when you pray, God guarantees us, you know, maybe, maybe let's define prayer the way Pastor Nzo defines it. Of course, it's based on John chapter 14. He says, prayer is asking the Father in the name of Jesus. And, and Jesus says, once you, you ask the Father in my name, then you shall be guaranteed that whatever you ask for is going to be done. So if you are guaranteed by God that what you ask for is going to be done, then you don't change your prayer because the situation didn't turn out right. You don't change your prayer because things are not coming together. You don't change your prayer because it seems as though things are not working out. Nehemiah said, I was ready to fight and defend what I believe God for. You need to step into the mode of fighting. One day, one day, God, God, God is dealing with, 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 with Jacob. And Jacob is coming from running away. He's going to meet his brother. And he prays to God, God, if you can protect me from my brother and he doesn't kill me, I'm going to give you tithes. Then after a while, he sends everybody away and he remains in a certain place. And when he was remaining in that place, the Bible says a man came. And of course, we believe that man was an angel. He wrestled him the whole night. And when he realized that this man is not giving up, he, he, he disjointed the hip bone of, 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 of Jacob. And now all of a sudden, Jacob can't fight anymore. And Jacob decides, I'm going to hold on to this man. And the man says to Jacob, uh, please let go of me because the day is about to break. You know, the sun is about to come out. And this is, I like the response of Jacob. Listen to what Jacob says. I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. There are times when you need to come to a place where you say, God, I'm going to stick to my prayer until I see it manifest. It doesn't matter what kind of opposition I'm facing. It doesn't matter whether Sanballat and Tobia are busy trying to neck me, are busy trying to discourage me, are busy trying to stop me from going where God wants me to go. I'm going to stick to my prayer and I'm going to believe God that the manifestation of my prayer is coming. You need to understand that when you prayed, God is ready to answer your prayer. The question is, are you ready to hold on to the prayer until God answers it? Are you ready to fight for what you believe God for? Nehemiah said, I've prayed about it. I believe God for it. And therefore, I'm ready to fight for it. We are living in a time of pandemic where life is difficult. Some of our dreams, we are forced to adjust them. But don't give up on what you believe God for. Never ever come to a place where you quit what you believed God for simply because something tragic happened. Continue to believe God for what God has promised you.
Continue to believe God that you will make it irrespective of the situation. Continue to believe God that you will continue to build that company. You'll continue to build that family. You'll continue to build that wall. You'll continue to build whatever it is that God promised you. You will continue to do it irrespective of what is happening around you. You might have to change the ideas of how you are going to carry out the plan, but don't change the original vision. Because what you prayed for, God is able to deliver. He's not going to use conventional methods. He might not answer you the way you thought he would, but he will definitely answer you. Nehemiah said, I'm going to fight for what I believe God for. Take that attitude with you today. To say, I planned a business and all of a sudden businesses are shutting down around me, but I'm not going to quit the vision. I'm going to ask God for a revelation of how I can do it, irrespective of what is going on around me. How am I going to carry out the same idea, the same proposition, the same thing that I want to do? How am I going to carry out differently, but the same thing? Nehemiah said, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue to pray because I believe God for what I prayed for. Keep building in spite of the opposition. If you are going to build your life around prayer, you are going to build your business around prayer, you are going to build your, your career around prayer, you are going to build your job around prayer, whatever you are going to build around prayer, continue to build irrespective of the opposition. Because the opposition will always be there. But people with prayer, people of prayer know that when opposition comes, they are ready to fight for what they believe in. Amen. May the Lord continue to bless you. I hope you are blessed. I hope you are going to continue. You are not going to quit on your dreams. You are going to continue to believe God for great things that are coming. 2021 is pregnant with with opportunities. 2021 is pregnant with great things. It's up to you whether you are going to shift with the masses and let go of the vision. Or you are going to be like Nehemiah and say, I'm going to build irrespective of opposition. It's up to you what you believe God for. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for building through prayer. We thank you that, Heavenly Father, when we don't have what it takes anymore, at least we've got prayer. And we've got a, pr- we've got a God behind the prayer who's ready to answer. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, that God Almighty, whenever we present our case before you in prayer, you are ready to answer and you are going to bring the manifestation of that prayer. I pray, Heavenly Father, for each and every person listening. God Almighty, touch their lives and help them to revisit the broken walls. Help them to re-inspect the brokenness in their lives and help them to rebuild what was broken out of their lives. Help them that, Father, as they approach life prayerfully, they may understand that prayer is in the revelation equation, but there are still steps that they need to take. I pray that Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, for every step that they take, release your blessing. Even though there is opposition, even though there are difficulties, release a blessing that will enable them to come to the place where the vision is fulfilled. I pray, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, let each and every one who's going to build their lives around prayer know that the God who promised Nehemiah to make it through is, is the same God who's making a promise to them. That weeping may endure for a night, but joy will definitely come in the morning. Pray that, Heavenly Father, you help us, equip us, so that we can know what is around us, that we can use, so that the vision can be carried forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. Change Bible Church. Now that you have heard the word, oh my God, the Bible gives us clear instructions, James 1, 22. Be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only. May what the Holy Spirit deposited in your spirit to do for 2021. Keep on doing it. Nature it. May you be fed. Continue to pray over it as you succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Church.